Before your presentation starts, I'd like to take a few moments to introduce you to the City of London Dental School. We are a private postgraduate dental school based in London and run from our college facility at Southgate. Here we offer a number of uh, various programmes, both short and degree programmes. At present we offer six MSc titles validated by the University of Bolton. These include clinical dentistry, orthodontics, periodontology, focal therapy and endodontics, uh, restorative and aesthetic dentistry and the specialist practice of restorative aesthetic dentistry combined with implantology. These are delivered from our state-of-the-art teaching facilities and to be introduced shortly are three more new titles we're also introducing the MSc in the Specialist Clinical Practice of Aesthetic Non-Surgical Interventions. This is to do with uh, facial cosmetics. The MSc in the Specialist Practice of Computer Guided Implantology. This is implantology but taught from a digital perspective. Also a combined MSc of Restorative Aesthetic Dentistry with Implantology. These programmes are all taught from our laboratories where hand-on uh, experience is required, where delegates get the opportunity to use the latest digital uh, equipment, printing materials, scanners, and also to practice prep techniques on phantoms. Our short programmes are in topics such as implantology, restorative and orthodontics. These programmes normally last anywhere between four to 12 months. We also offer clinical internships in the UK and the UAE, where delegates get to treat patients directly. In addition to this, we offer diploma and certificate programs. These programs are at HE level 7, so they're university certificates, which means that they can be used towards MSc programs, not just MSc programs that are offered by the City of London, but also other programs. So thank you for sparing the time to listen to this presentation. If you want any more information, then please contact us at info at City of London Dental School .co.uk. I hope you enjoy your presentation today. Just to introduce Ed and how the program's going to be running. Um, today we're going to be talking about digital dentistry. Uh, Ed is a very knowledgeable uh, dental technician. Um, he has a, a large laboratory with attached surgery for training uh, in Nottingham. Uh, his laboratory was founded by his grandfather in 1913. So it's a very long established uh, company in the UK for those who are joining us from abroad. And uh, we're very lucky and fortunate to have Ed with us today. And um, uh, we've been involved with uh, dental technology as Stuart mentioned for many years. Uh, the lab started in 1913. Um, I joined the family business in the late uh, 90s and um, really that was an interesting time for the lab sector because um, we were seeing quite a lot of offshoring going on, quite a lot of um, work uh, being done elsewhere and uh, I suppose we were facing um, some interesting challenges. Um, so we decided to invest heavily in digital technology and the presentation today that I'm going to give is about that journey. Um, I'm not coming from any particular perspective of selling any technologies. I will mention some brand names. I'm not necessarily getting uh, paid to do that, um, but uh, I just want to give a, an unbiased um, overview of the technology. Um, and we've got a lot to cover today um, in, in this uh, presentation. So um, at the end of it, I hope the outcomes you'll get are that you'll be conversant um, with the various different digital technologies. You'll understand the different dental workflows um, and the relative merits um, of each manufacturing technology. Um, as Stuart mentioned, um, 
obviously we've got a lot of people today. I think there are a hundred and uh, there were over a hundred uh, um, applicants. I think there were 140. So we're limited to a hundred on, on this particular Zoom technology. Um, so thank you for those uh, that have been able to make it. Um, and without further ado, we'll, we'll crack on with the presentation. And if you have got questions, just put them in the messaging box, as Stuart mentioned, and we can uh, field those uh, as we go through or, or uh, at the end. So normally when I give this presentation, uh, I'm facing the audience. So I ask people to stick their hands up and ask um, what experience they have of digital and um, uh, what particular applications. Obviously, we're not able to do that. So what I'm going to um, do is try and give an overview and bring everybody into the same place and then move forward and look at some of the applications. So these are some of the scanning. Hi, if somebody's got their uh, mic on, could they um, mute it or I can mute all? Okay, can everybody still hear me? Great. All right. So um, looking at the technologies. I need to yeah. it to you. Okay, right, come on guys. Come on, yes. Mommy, where's my claw? I give you chocolate. Where's my claw? So I just uh, think we've got somebody on the line there. If they can mute their mic. I've just muted everybody's mic, so hopefully um, you can all still hear me. Uh, my mic's uh, not muted. That's great. So uh, looking at the technologies, uh, we're going to look at data acquisition, first of all, and the various different modes of data acquisition. Um, this is the starting point for the digital workflow. Um, when we look at digital technologies, a lot of people push the technology per se, and I personally think that's the wrong approach. What we need to look at is the relative merits of the application of the technology to particular parts of the workflow and where it fits into the workflow. Um, and the starting point for us um, was impressions because that's the way our lab had always worked. Um, so we wanted to fit digital technology into the existing classic workflow um, and the starting point was to capture the data. So we brought in the uh, early 2000s, I think we were the first lab in the UK to bring in um, laser scanning of models and the scanner that you can see in the uh, top left of this slide uh, was the scanner that we had well 20 years ago now and believe it or not the technology that modern uh, desktop scanners and intraoral scanners are based on is exactly the same technology as, as 20 years ago. Obviously things have moved on in terms of software, um, but the idea of the scanning is the same. And basically the method of scanning is to project uh, light on the object which is being scanned, in this case a dye, if you look at the uh, picture in the um, bottom left of the screen. And there you can see a laser line projected on the die and where the laser light shines on the die it casts a profile and that profile is captured by two CCD cameras, a stereoscopic pair of cameras that see the profile from two slightly different angles just like we uh, see things stereoscopically with our two eyes from slightly two different angles and then our, our brains are able to take the two different perspectives as the same object and merge them together into a 3D image. That's exactly the same um, process um, with uh, digital scanning. Basically, uh, a, a, the object is illuminated with a laser beam. Two cameras capture two different perspectives of that laser beam and merge it back together into a 3D point in space. And then the object is rotated around and another image is captured and so on and so on until you've got 360 degree view and profile of the object. And then the software is able to merge that back together into a, a 3D uh, point cloud. Um, so technology's obviously moved on and as you can see um, on the right hand side of this slide, scanners now have more axes, so they have five axes. Uh, they're able to very quickly capture the data. In the old days it used to take 
five minutes to scan a die and about 30 minutes to scan a model. Um, now uh, we can scan a model in uh, under 10 seconds. And impression scanning is possible as well, of course. So we are seeing people skip uh, the model casting stage now and directly scan impressions. That does have some limitations because we're using optical scanning techniques. Uh, obviously the scanner can only capture what it can see and particularly with undercut anterior um, impressions uh, it's sometimes difficult to capture those in a 3D scanner um, but probably 90% 95% of impressions are scannable and the 5% that aren't well we cast a model and uh, then we scan that model the other thing that's come in um, is batch processing. So we can load lots of different dies. In the old days, it was 14 dies on that uh, three axis carousel. Now we can load uh, 24 or more dies and scan them all simultaneously. And that's greatly improved progress. So the Second form of scanning that came in uh, for desktop scanners uh, about 10 years ago uh, was called projected light scanning or structured light scanning. And this is exactly the same principle as laser scanning, except rather than a single laser beam being projected onto the object, uh, we project uh, a barcode pattern, a pattern that's known. Um, and we can vary that pattern. So we're using the DLP light projectors um, that you see for PowerPoint presentations um, to project a pattern onto the object. Uh, the, the advantage is, of course, that uh, we're capturing more than one profile per position of the gimbal, and that leads to faster data acquisition. Um, the disadvantage, and we'll come onto this when we talk about intraoral scanning, because they use similar technology, um, is that obviously, We've got an optical arrangement here projecting um, a pattern from a DLP projector and that has a certain depth of field. So depending on uh, the distance of the object to be scanned from the um, optics, uh, the, the, the obviously the, the projected pattern may or may not be in focus. So whilst the scanning is much quicker, it has less depth of field. Whereas on the uh, laser scanning, the laser beam is in focus from zero to infinity. So we can capture highly accurately at whatever ever position we are in the scanner and whatever depth of field. The other thing about um, structured light scanning is that in the early days, it was white light as shown here. Um, and now obviously um, white light uh, has the drawback of chromatic aberration. That is that as the white light passes through the optics, it diffracts uh, the very different wavelengths of the light, diffract to different extents, the sort of rainbow effect that you see through optics. Um, and this can cause um, a, a certain measurement inaccuracy or uncertainty. Um, and this is why most of the desktop scanners now have moved to um, single wavelength light to uh, blue light typically. Um, and we, we need to remember this technology drawback when we start talking about interaural scanning because interaural scanners um, use the same structured light technology for the most part. And um, that does limit certain indications. So what, whatever the salespeople tell you, um, we'll, we'll look at uh, some of the questions that you should be asking of them um, when, when, they're, when they're demonstrating that technology to you. Typically, desktop scanners now are sub 10 micron, typically 5 to 10 micron accuracy. And when you think about um, the accuracy of the original recording of the impression, um, that probably wasn't accurate to more than 5 to 10 micron, I would hazard a guess, probably more like 20, 25 micron. And then, of course, when the model was cast, um, that was another slight degradation in accuracy and other measurement uncertainty from the casting process itself. So when we've got um, scanners that are capable of scanning at 5 micron, 10 micron, they're more than accurate enough to do the job. And, and this is another um, kind of little uh, trap that people get into that 
um, there's a kind of technology race where everybody says, oh, my scan is 10 micron, mine's five micron, mine's two micron, etc." Well, there is no point in having a scanning technology that scans more accurately than the original recording medium. All you're doing there is capturing additional data, which is creating larger scan file sizes, which are going to take longer to process. So the scanners that you're looking at, be they desktop or interaural, only need to replicate the accuracy of the classic workflow. Um, they don't need to be super, super accurate to the point where they're recording redundant uh, data. Uh, and this is another point to take into consideration when you're making a choice of the technology. As well as desktop scanners, of course, um, we've seen the march of the intraoral scanners and um, there's a selection of them here. In our lab, um, it was interesting in the UK, the take up was relatively slow until about, I would say, 10 years ago. And around that time, um, there were a lot of proprietary file format systems. So each manufacturer was trying to um, lock uh, people users into a, into their particular workflow. Um, certainly, we saw that with Serec. Um, Serec units were very popular. They 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 were around from the mid eighties, and um, Serec worked in its own particular file format in a closed system, um, and that was very successful and continues to be really successful. But in the sort of uh, around two thousand and seven time. Um, to 2010, we saw this move for open systems. And I think now that story is really, uh, that race is run. Uh, and, and the question on everybody's lips when they first looking at getting into a technology, is it open or not? So even uh, closed systems like Serec uh, are now open. You're able to export files in an open file format. Uh, and the industry standard uh, has fallen on STL file format for the moment, and that's uh, the stereolithography it comes from, which is 3D printing. And that takes the point cloud um, in 3D space that's been captured by whichever scanning technology and turns it into a triangle mesh um, that represents the surface, the anatomy of, of whatever's being scanned, the prep or the tooth or so on. And that STL file technology is now the industry standard file format for interchanging between intraoral scanners, lab scanners, desktop scanners, um, CAD stations, um, 3D printers, and so on. And similarly, obviously, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, ITERO units come in um, on the back of um, Invisalign, and they too were traditionally um, closed format systems. Um, but I think uh, Cadence are an opportunity to open up those systems and they've, they've gone open STL file format as well now. And of course, you'll probably know um, that there's a restorative workflow uh, available. So if you have um, uh, uh, a uh, ITERO element or uh, any other ITERO scanner, um, you can ask your rep now to enable the restorative workflow and not only use it for orthodontic, but also use it for crown and bridge and other applications. Um, and that all uploads data by the cloud via a portal, which is then able to be shared openly between restorative labs such as, uh, such as ours, but there's a whole network of labs out there. And then we can see um, some other scanners uh, in the bottom part of the slide. Um, you can see obviously the three shape scanner there. Three shape scanner is very popular, um, good technology. But again, um, we need to think about some of the uh, drawbacks of this technology. So uh, a lot of scanners um, promote color scanning. And I think color scanning for interaural is really important. It's really useful. It adds a lot of extra data, um, particularly from a um, a technician's perspective, when we get the data in the lab, um, identifying the margin, for example, from an intraoral scan, particularly if it's subgingival, can, can be tricky. Um, but with color data, um, that, that makes life a little bit easier. 
The drawback, of course, is that if you're going to scan in color, you have to use white light scanning. And um, the minute you start use, using white light scanning, you have the same problems with measurement uncertainty from chromatic aberration. So um, what we're seeing with the latest generations of intraoral scanner is that they'll capture the 3D data uh, monochromatic, so they'll project blue light from the scanner um, onto the prep or the tooth. And then they'll do a second overlay scan with white light to capture the color data, and they'll merge the two scans together to create a composite image. So um, yes, um, go for uh, a, a color scanner if you can, um, but make sure that when the scanner's capturing um, the actual uh, an anatomical data that it's doing in a, it in a monochromatic mode. I think the other thing to look for with intraoral scanners is is um, to be careful really with on sales pitches is is speed of scan, and you, you will see um, reps uh, come in and say that they can scan a full arch in ten seconds or or twenty seconds or whatever else. Well. Um, I can tell you that all of these devices have a demo mode and um, that demo mode captures data at a much lower resolution. So whilst um, it may look very impressive um, doing a full arch in 20 seconds uh, with a rep scanning themselves, um, what we need to be asking is, is, is what, what is the resolution of that data? What's the quality of the data that they're actually capturing? And you'll find that if, you say you'd like to do a high resolution scan for let's say an all on four or an all on six uh, implant born restoration, um, uh, that they'll have to switch scanning modes and, and the device will actually scan slower than on, on the demo. So, so ju just be aware there are a couple of um, uh, tricks going on out there. Um, the other thing to be aware of is the data processing and, and the availability of the data. Um, because it's obviously the mouth is a very, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of clutter and noise from um, a scanning point of view, from an engineering point of view. Uh, saliva um, causes multiple path propagation of light, um, all kinds of things. Soft tissue can get in the way, as we've already said, um, you know, to, to see um, prep subgingival, uh, you need to use refraction cord. Um, and obviously, uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of challenges there. Um, so, uh, let me just mute that mic. So, um, basically, be very careful about your choice of intraoral scanner, and also be careful about what the scanner is doing with the data. And this is another thing that people don't see, as as the scanners move around the arch. Watch very carefully, particularly on the scanning the lower arch um, as you see and all intraoral scanners suffer from this um, because they can only see uh, a small window probably two three teeth as they move around because the head of the device obviously for the patient comfort has to be of a certain size so the way they work is that in the head of the device um, they have a mirror at 45 degrees and all of the electronics are in the handle of the device. So they project the um, structured light image um, down the handle of the device onto the mirror, onto the tooth surface, and then the reflected light is projected back by that mirror into the, into the stereoscopic cameras, which are, which are also in the handle of the device. Um, so, so we need to um, realize the limitations that that, that, that can cause. Because it can only see a small segment of the arch, as the scanner moves around, each segment of the scan may well be accurate, as the manufacturer claims, to 10, 15, 20 micron. But as, as, as you move around the arch scanning, the software is stitching all of these separate images um, together into a composite image. And what happens is that each, each time each image is stitched together, you get a slight additional stitching error. So whilst the individual 
segments of the image may be accurate to the claim 20 micron, 25 micron, you get a cumulative error molar to molar, which may be significantly higher. And particularly as you come around the arch, scanning the twos and the threes on the lower, um, because of the anatomy there, virtually all of the scanners that I've seen um, get uh, issues with stitching those images together. And what, what we, we see, and you'll see it if you ask the, to do a demo, and I would always ask to do a hands-on demo if you're thinking about getting an intraoral scanner. What, what we see is the software is very clever, and it may not realize that it's misstitched uh, the images, particularly around the twos and threes, so that the whole arch is slightly compressed. And then when you scan the opposing, the upper, and you scan the occlusion, software creates virtual occlusion and suddenly realizes that it stitched the lower arch incorrectly. And you'll see at some point in the scanning, I, either in real time or, or afterward, that the arch is corrected. So be aware of the drawbacks of these devices. Um, the software is, is interpreting the data. For example, with iTero on the restorative workflow, um, we don't get the data as a lab straight away. So the customer, uh, the client may say, you know, we've uploaded the data on Tuesday at four o'clock in the afternoon after the patient's appointment. And we, from their point of view, the data has actually been sent to us. But in fact, what's happened is the data has been uploaded in the cloud and then the data is manually cleansed before we are able to download it. So there's a data processing center somewhere on the other side of the planet that uh, is using people to remove the noise and clutter and stitching errors and, and holes in the scans um, before they then allow us to download the data, um, which is of a suitable quality for the restorative workflow. So whether it's offline manually or uh, in real time in software, um, and, and the ITRO element now, for example, does it in real time, be aware that not all of the data that you're using is, is recorded data from the scanning device. Some of the data is interpolated um, to fill holes, stitch the triangle mesh together. And, and this, is, this is an issue with all interaural scanners. But as long as you're aware of that, then you'll be aware of the indications uh, and when it's suitable and when it isn't. And I'm sure we can discuss that a bit more towards the end uh, of the program. I just show this slide um, slightly tongue in cheek that actually this is this is less than 10 years ago. I think this is about seven years ago. Um, and look at the size of that uh, wand there. And, you know, uh, that shows you how quickly the technology is moving on. It, it was so cumbersome then. And now um, you know, we're seeing that the ones, the 3D scanning ones are typically the size of a handpiece or slightly larger, um, much easier to use, much more comfortable for the patient. Um, so technology has moved along very, very rapidly. And I would say now, um, it's, it, it's got to a point, um, where, where, uh, it's, it's extremely usable, um, price point has come down. And I think the other thing to bear in mind is post um, COVID-19, as we all try to um, get back to the new normal, as everybody calls it, um, you know, cross infection control in the surgery is obviously gonna be um, a major issue for us all. And I think, you know, digital will have a much greater role to play um, versus classic impressioning. However, there will still always be times when um, it's more appropriate to take an impression um, than an interoral scan. Um, and I would still, for, for complex implant work, um, you know, I, I would prefer both. So I would like an impression and an interoral scan, um, just so that we can validate uh, the two together for the, for the time being anyway. But as I say, technology is moving along very quickly. I think now it's not a case of the hardware because the ones are there and the technology is there and it's good and it's reliable. Um, but the software is moving very quickly now. Um, and we're seeing some amazing things coming in the software, which we can talk about in the next part of the presentation. 
So just looking quickly at the software, anything as technicians um, that we uh, traditionally could do in wax um, can now be done digitally and that can be done digitally chair side or in the lab. So the next sort of question that this technology poses is, um, how, how does this fit with it with a classic workflow? Um, what what things should be done where? Um, and I would say there's no hard and fast rule. Um, technology should really be easy to use, simple, and, and enhance um, the patient journey uh, and not not impede it. So I'm not a, I'm not a great believer in technology for technology's sake. As I said at the start, you know it, need, it needs to, it needs to be useful, and we need to have pragmatic use of it. So the first point I suppose is about design with CAD. Now, um, there's a lot of chairside CAD available now. Um, it's excellent, it's really good. Um, if we're gonna make a provisional chairside, then I think it makes a lot of sense um, to use chairside CAD, as long as the automatic design um, proposition of the software is, is appropriate, um, particularly in the occlusion. Um, if, um, as surgeons, we need to uh, adjust the design and spend a lot of time on, 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 on fiddling with the design, I'm not sure that does make complete sense to do chair side. Um, and, and in this case, it, there may be an argument for using the interaural scanner um, uh, as a replacement for the silicon or alginate and impression tray, um, but then uploading the data to the cloud um, where your local lab can access it, um, download the data, they can do the CAD design, upload the data back to you um, where you can approve it. And then if you want to manufacture a restoration, you can do so chair side for a temporary, for example, provisional um, using a chair side milling system. On the other hand, you may want to do the design yourself. And as I said, anything um, that's possible uh, in WAX can now uh, be done digitally so that the CAD software is really 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 powerful though but we do see still with the automated design um, some issues sometimes with occlusion um, and the, the, the lab software um, that we use um, is able to do full virtual articulation and we can load in any articulator like um, a DINAR or an Artex and we can do a full full virtual articulation. So we, we generally find that if the time's taken to do the occlusion and check the occlusion um, uh, with a technician in the lab, um, that you might get a better result on the final bite. Um, but still, things can happen where they're most appropriate to happen. Uh, we're, we're also seeing now um, bureaus, CAD bureaus, which popping up where you can upload your scans and they will do uh, an anatomical design and return it to you within minutes. Um, and these, these bureaus are based all over the world. So things are moving very quickly. Um, and, and it's an interesting to experiment with those offerings and, and, and make your own judgment about um, how well it works for you. Um, but again, I would say, take a pragmatic look at the technology um, and, and how it adds benefit to your practice uh, rather than just the technology per se, although it can be a good sales tool and certainly a good um, communications tool for the patient. So here's some more uh, examples of uh, CAD software, use chair side, uh, again, routine crown and bridge work. Um, the next modality that I'd like to talk about, and this is covered in um, one of um, Stuart's other lectures on implantology, but I need to touch on it today because it's another mode of data acquisition, um, is uh, cone beam CT. And um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, these machines were really expensive. Um, they've come down a lot in price now. They're more affordable in, in general practice. Um, you know, we're talking un, under 40K for some of these units. Um, they basically uh, obviously use uh, ionizing radiation, uh, X-ray to, to, to capture the image. Um, and that, of course, carries its own risk assessment. But these 
digital units now are uh, extremely low dose and um, a volume scan of uh, uh, quadrant the mandible can be uh, less than the amount of dose that you get for example flying from uh, uh, Heathrow to New York uh, post post lockdown so um, uh, much more common now uh, they capture data in in a different way um, rather than capturing data in STL file format with a triangle mesh uh, they produce data in a DICOM file format, which is like um, a stack of um, JPEG uh, images, each of which is a slice um, through, through the object that's scanned. So uh, DICOM data typically is, is lower resolution than STL, um, because obviously the resolution of uh, DICOM data depends on the dose of radiation that the patient receives. So typically the slice um, the space between each slice is 0.5 or 0.25 um, millimeters, uh, 250 to, to 500 micron, as opposed to um, you know, 5 to 10 micron for an optical scan of models. So um, slightly lower uh, resolution, um, but uh, when you're scanning a patient, but of course they provide all of the um, bone density information that one needs for surgical planning. Now, these scanners can scan in a high resolution mode as well at around 25 micron, um, but it's a much higher dose radiation. So we see sometimes that when um, clients refer patients for um, a CBCT scan, uh, that they'll also send an impression and the impression can be loaded into the CBCT scanner and scanned at high resolution and then the data sets um, merge together to give a composite image of the requisite accuracy. So in, in the old days, we used to send the patients with a scan stent. We still do that, but we don't need to put these um, uh, little gutter perca uh, balls and the sulcus there. They were originally there to help us co-locate the images. Um, it, a scan stent is still useful if you're sending a patient um, uh, for a CB, referring a patient for a, a C, CBCT scan um, because we can uh, get a good idea of the position of the teeth. And there's a whole um, variety of different workflows um, around, around this, all kinds of permutations, combinations, vari variations on the theme. Some people like to do hand wax ups. Um, some people, as in this case, create a scan stent uh, where the teeth are mixed with 10% barium sulfate so that they can be segmented out separately. Um, but the general idea is to get an overall composite image that is suitable for treatment planning, for placement of implants, and, and potentially restorative work as well. And I can show in a minute how those two um, workflows mix together. It's no longer necessary to put these radio opaque co-location markers on the on the um, scan stent because the software um, prompts you to pick up anatomical landmarks on 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 the model and on the patient scan um, and then it uses those anatomical landmarks to co-locate uh, the images so there we are images merged together the other thing to say about um, Comium CT scanning is that the individual slices of JPEG slices, image slices from, from the scan need to be converted back into a three-dimensional object. And this process is called segmentation. Now, um, each, each uh, uh, slice um, has a certain uh, recording uh, of radio density in Hounsfield unit of the patient. And, and, and the, uh, the process of um, segmentation effectively draws contours of uh, similar radio density across the slices to uh, extrapolate out a, a 3D image. Um, so so th there's an image processing going on there. And, and I guess another thing that we should remember in either CBCT or optical scanning is, is that the device is recording the data, but to actually get to a 3D representation of that data requires some 
3D processing. And that, that, that in itself brings in um, a certain measurement uncertainty or error. So just looking at that workflow, um, if we were to want to do uh, so-called multimodal scanning um, for placement of um, implants, planning the placement of implants, creating a surgical guide using 3D printing, and pre-manufacturing the restorative restoration, then that's, that's possible now. So we, we, we refer the patient for a, a CT scan. Um, we take an impression uh, or uh, uh, we do an intraoral scan uh, to get the high resolution scan. And then we merge the two data sets together. So the CT scan accurate to 500 micron, the optical, scan either intraoral or of the model accurate 10 to 15 micron and then we merge the two data sets together and in doing that we're able to clear out the clutter um, uh, or artifact the noise that, that is in the, the CT scan and we're also able to improve the overall accuracy of the composite image to a level where we can start to plan uh, the placement of implants and the provisional um, restoration. So this is one package that, that, that we quite like and use um, called co-diagnostics. Co um, there are plenty of others out there. Um, uh, I, know, I know that um, Stuart uh, uses uh, Caesar access software on his courses and, and that's also um, excellent. SMOP is another one uh, that you see in various different guises and skins, um, which is embedded in other softwares. And then Planmeca, uh, do a very good one, Romexis software. So here we, here we see a case um, where we're planning um, an, a, um, a lower anterior bridge. Um, we have the CT data, and here you can really clearly see at the brown the resolution of the CT data once it's been um, segmented and turned back into a 3D um, model. Um, you can really see the slices there in the data. Um, and then the purple is the optical scan of the model. And the first process is to identify anatomical landmarks um, to co-locate the two images together accurately. Once that's done, we can start to plan where the implants are going to go. The softwares these days all include libraries of the implants. So every different implant system has a library which you can load into the open software. Again, an important point, these are all open systems. So you can work with anybody's implant system, anybody's CT scan, anybody's intraoral scan or optical model scan. We can trace out anatomy. We can tr trace out uh, the nerve canal and make sure um, that we're safe in, in where we're planning to place the implants. Um, and I think also from uh, a planning point of view, showing um, in, in the treatment uh, notes that, that, that we've carried out, this is, is very useful, um, both, both from explaining and planning the protocol with the technician from a restorative perspective, but also from a, um, a medical legal point of view to, to make sure that we've uh, covered ourselves on that. Once we've uh, planned the position of the implants, the software um, is able to, to generate a surgical guide. Um, and this guide may be tooth-borne, it may be, um, uh, it may be um, mucosa born or bone born, And um, the guide uh, has pre-manufactured into it, it's usually with 3D printing, um, uh, uh, parts that will then accept press fit sleeves uh, through which um, the, the drill shank will be guided uh, to, to place the implant. And typically, in this particular case, um, it comes with a set of uh, which are called spoons. They're concentric sleeves that will fit in so that you have an interference fit sleeve that pushes into the 3D printed guide. Um, and then you put a concentric sleeve into that to do the pilot drill, remove the concentric sleeve and, and, and do the main um, drill at, at size and then you're able to place down those sleeves. Um, we do um, fenestrate um, the guide as you can see here on the, on the threes um, so that the clients can make sure it's fully home and down 
um, before before they uh, do the drilling. This is a typical technique that you can, people like to do hand wax ups. Um, there are all kinds of different workflows and variations on a theme as I say. And then one thing that I do like about um, uh, co-diagnostics is that it has this package called Synergy. So you're able to plan the placement of the implants from a clinical point of view in your practice on your workstation there. But in real time in the lab, we're able to see where you're planning those implants. And we've got the restorative CAD workstation open, which is linked to your clinical um, session. And we can then uh, see from placement angles, what is the most um, preferable restorative option. We can select the abutments, um, we can pre-manufacture the provisional or design the provisional restoration. So um, having this uh, linked between CAD of the restorative element and um, planning of the clinical element, I think is really powerful. And you know, for immediate loading, um, very, very useful indeed. And also a great communication tool between um, the dentist and, and their technician. So just quickly, there's a third uh, modality and I'm aware time's, time's marching on. Um, and that is optical scanning um, of, of the face. Um, and there are apps available now um, which you can get uh, both for iPhone and Android. Um, Bellus uh, 3D is one, um, it's, it's free. Um, go on the app store after this and uh, download it and give it a try. Um, really, really good app and outputs SDL data. So we're able now to incorporate optical facial scanning in full color from mobile phone apps into the treatment planning for digital smile design. Um, and this is really, really useful. So one way to do it is again, we need to get anatomical landmarks to co-locate the data. We can, using the segmentation process, we can pick a different fil Hounsfield filter and we can actually um, get soft tissue uh, out of the um, DICOM data. And then we can pick anatomical landmarks on that soft tissue to co-locate um, the mobile phone app, Bellus 3D op optical facial scan data. Um, it can also be done with a bite fork. So I've seen people use a little, little, little uh, bite fork with a co-location device on it. There are, again, all sorts of different clever ways that you can do it. But expect now that the optical facial scanning is going to become more and more popular chair side. And the, the great potential here that I'm sure you can all see is um, uh, virtual smile design. And you, know, you, you could have a patient, intraoral scan them, optically facial scan them, upload, upload that data to the lab. The lab can do a, a virtual diagnostic wax up. Send that, yeah, back, yeah. send that back to the practice. And um, you can then uh, show the patient in 3D um, how they will look uh, if they elect to have the treatment done. Um, a very powerful want to make a decision chair side, they might want to make a decision later, they'd be able to access their data, review it in 3D on their phone. Um, it, the treatment simulation in software is is a big growth area at the moment. Um, we're gonna we're gonna see we're already seeing that obviously in ortho um, with the outcome simulator um, in itero uh, and others. Uh, but uh, we're also seeing um, the software being able to detect caries from the intraoral scan um, and a number of other aspects using artificial intelligence. So. I think the data gathering technologies in terms of the ones for intraoral scanning, in terms of the CBCT units, in terms of the optical facial scanning now with mobile phones, the hardware is all there. 
a lot of the development now is in software and we're going to see this move really, really quickly. And I think we're at a real um, interesting turning point here now, pivot point, because um, because possibly because of lockdown and, and, and um, COVID, we've all become a lot more uh, conversant with IT, with meeting virtually such as this. And I think um, everybody's mindsets are towards that. So I can see that actually an outcome from this is that it's going to accelerate the, the process of adopting digital technologies in a clinical setting for dentistry. Very quickly, um, because I want to come on to the manufacturing technologies, um, we're also using 3D technologies that have been applied and commercialized in dentistry in cranial and maxillofacial um, work. So we, we, we were the UK's first digital production center in, in dental in, in 2000. Um, and around 2003, we started working on applying those processes to CMF. Um, and we started a separate business now, manufacturing patient specific implants. This case here was of a um, professional squash player who unfortunately um, had an orbital fracture, uh, zygomatic uh, uh, injury uh, from the opponent's racket and had had uh, two uh, orbital floor replacements using a generic uh, uh, titanium mesh called Mevcore, um, which were unsuccessful. So we were able to um, take a, a CT scan, uh, mirror that image uh, to create a virtual orbital floor and then manufacture a patient specific implant to reconstruct the orbital floor. So we can see that um, there's going to be a crossover from dental through cranial maxillofacial into orthopedics of custom made medical devices. And it's, it's really exciting at this time to be in the lab and be in dentistry when dentistry is really leading the way and leading the world in terms of um, adoption of technology into a, a medical um, setting. Quickly on CAD, um, as I said earlier on in the presentation, anything that we can do in WAX now um, we can do digitally. So I think a lot of the CAD software from an anatomical design point of view is there. Inlays, onlays, veneers, crowns, complex bridges, um, implant borne restorations. Um, and digital manufacturing moves on a lot as well as we're going to come on to talk about um, in a second. So that um, all aspects of the lab work now, uh, and certainly in our lab work, have some element of digital technology, crown and bridge, um, ortho implant, obviously, um, and uh, uh, cobalt chrome uh, partials, um, dentures now digitally designed and manufactured. And the last um, area to hold out, I suppose, was uh, acrylic prosthetics. But even there now, we're seeing um, very flat, rapid advancements in manufacturing technologies. Um, so all the different disparate elements of the workflow this this jigsaw are all beginning to slot together very nicely now and again i think it's something that moves moves to an overall digitization of the, the workflow so let's start talking quickly about manufacturing we're, we're um, just under an hour and we've got half an hour to go um, in terms of manufacturing um, you've got two basic technologies and they they are called additive and subtractive subtractive is milling or grinding and this can be done um, chair side or in the lab and on this point I think a lot of technicians um, got kind of threatened I suppose about um, chair side milling but we don't see it like that because from my perspective things will happen where they're most appropriate to happen so um, technologies that are smaller have, have certain capabilities and technologies, the larger, more complex, have other capabilities. So, you know, for manufacturing uh, a, a temporary, um, a provisional chair side, um, certain uh, hybrid materials, uh, nano composite materials, for example, absolutely perfect to manufacture chair side. And the great thing is that once the design's done, that data is still, um, 
appropriate for manufacturing a provisional, uh, a definitive using um, other milling technologies. So I think complex um, manufacturing operations will which require more expensive capital investment will probably happen further away from chair side and simpler processes will happen near chair side and that's a completely normal uh, and appropriate manufacturing process. The other thing is that manufacturing might be distributed. So, um, you know, certain things might be milled chair side, uh, certain things might not be suitable for manufacturing chair side, so they'll be sent to a local lab. That local lab might not have all of the facilities within their lab to justify buying a, you know, a very expensive piece of equipment. So they, they might, might then subcontract digitally part of the restoration to a national production centre which can afford to justify those more expensive pieces of kit. And indeed, there may be some things that a national production centre like ours can't do that we have to subcontract to the one or two production centres in Europe that have a half million pound piece of equipment that they can justify for that. So distributed manufacturing and distributed workflow is, is going to become, and already is actually, part of the, the whole makeup of, of digital dentistry in the future. And that, that, of course, is great because it provides opportunities for flexible manufacturing. But it also means that the workflow has got to be stitched together somehow. And all of these different disparate elements of digital manufacturing all need to come together at the right time in the right place. And I think that's where um, a lot of work's happening in, in, in software now. And we can start to see a flavor for that in terms of um, uh, the... Uh, um, in, ter in terms of the distributed manufacturing that's going on. Um, so digital basically is, is moving uh, forward a pace. And, and, and I suppose we also see it with uh, the bureaus for CAD design. Those, those bureaus are um, operating remotely. They're doing a design and bringing it back in. So we'll see distributed manufacturing um, merging with dental practice management. So there'll be a convergence between your dental practice management software and your 3D scanning software and your CAD software and your manufacturing software. And, and this is going to create different channels to market, different opportunities um, for marketing. The kind of Google of dentistry is going to happen um, where people will see that, it, for example, a zirconia's crowns being prescribed chair side and they'll be able to predict what materials are required, what tools are required to finish that in the lab, and, and, and that, that will be part of the supply chain. So we're, we're really just at the start of this huge digital integration, but all of the different elements of it are there. So milling, um, coming back to the slide in hand, um, obviously chair side mills um, have a smaller milling capacity mill single units, larger machines such as this can mill full arch in multiple materials. Um, but nevertheless, it's the same process of cutting uh, out of a solid block of material. Once the um, framework or full restoration is finished, obviously it has to be removed from the block, the sprues have to be cut back and it has to be hand finished. And these technologies are the same whether they're chair side or in the or in the practice. Um, now we need to think about the amount of work that's required to finish things um, and, and whether it makes sense to be doing that work in the practice or whether it makes sense uh, to be doing it in the lab. Um, and obviously it depends on what you value your chair side time at. Um, and I don't have any particular opinion on it, um, but it, it strikes me that um, things that can be fairly simply and quickly finished chair side are suitable to be done chair side. Things that have to be, for example, zirconia, which has to be sintered for many hours overnight in a furnace, um, are less appropriate to be done in chair side and make more sense to be done in a lab. But again, I think we all need to be flexible in the future. And indeed, with our um, offering, we'll fit in wherever is most appropriate in the digital workflow. So for example, if you, we respect that you've had a long relationship with a local lab, uh, built up over many years and they understand how how you want things finishing and, and, and you know we, we certainly don't want to, 
to tread on those toes. Um, but what we could do is that perhaps your local lab, um, you know, smaller local lab doesn't have all of the digital facilities available to them, um, or they can't justify spending several hundred thousand pounds on a large piece of digital equipment. So, uh, or they may not even be able to receive uh, intraoral scans because they don't have a CAD station or a scanner. So in this case, um, clients send their digital scans direct to us. We will 3D print a model we'll manufacture the substructure and then we'll send the substructure on the model to their local lab that will then hand veneer and finish it and send to them. So you can see a lot more of this kind of flexible working going on uh, where we'll, we and others will fit into the workflow wherever it's most appropriate and where it adds value. But I think we all need to respect, <clears throat> a lot of people see digital as a great consolidation of the market and, um, you know, it'll be the death of the small lab. I don't think that's the case because um, at the end of the day, we're in a relationship driven business, um, both with your patients and between you and, and the lab. And and the lab understands, your little local lab understands your um, how, how you want things doing. Um, they're very responsive to you. They're, they're, they're physically close to you. So, um, you know, why, why would we want Want to jump over that relationship let's preserve that relationship and let's enable it with digital technologies that's our general philosophy anyway so just to show that another thing that happened with this kind of um vhs betamax argument in in the software that was overcome in 2007 when proprietary file formats um uh, gave way to open open software in stl um, also, a lot of the manufacturers um, manufacture materials that only fit in certain machines. Um, for example, here we can see an Emacs blank um, in the purple block uh, top left and a TeleoCAD blank um, uh, bottom right. And they have bayonet fittings, as you all well know, that only fit in certain machines. Well, again, I think that story is, is, is that race is run because um, these days you can get um, adapters, as you can see here, um, that you can fit those proprietary blank formats in and then load them into generic um, milling machines. <clears throat> so the days of locking um, people into a workflow where they have to use a particular material in a particular machine are, are gone. And that's great for all of us because it increases competition and flexibility in, in the workflow. So that's subtractive manufacturing. Now let's talk about additive manufacturing. Um, or 3D printing. Uh, our journey with 3D printing started um, in 2005 with a company called Envision Tech that's still going today. Um, and perhaps I can share with you um, some of the um, mistakes that we made on that on that journey. It was a new technology. It still is a relatively new technology, um, but oh, you'll have heard a lot about it. And um, there's huge potential. Excuse me. So 3D printing is an additive technology. And as I said, the first technology that we work with was from a company called Envision Tech. You can see here on the screen something called a nesting program. And actually this nesting program is the same for subtractive and additive. And what you do is basically try and get the most out of a material that you possibly can. So you take all of the different restorations that you want to manufacture in one batch and you nest them almost in a 3D game of Tetris Onto a, onto a blank or a build platform. Um, and that's basically showing there a set of bridges that have all been nested onto the build platform. So <clears throat> how, do, how does this 3D printing work? Well, this is uh, Envision Tech solution back in uh, 2005. And this, uh, Heinrich, who's the guy, or Hendrik, who's the guy who invented this process, this SLA process, this is now the basis of all of the form labs machines. The patent, his patent's expired, um, but they all work on this process. So how, how does it work? Basically, um, at the bottom of the screen, uh, you've got a, a bath of uh, photopolymerizing liquid. And you can just see in that thin brown line there that that is the photopolymer. And then you've got a glass plate underneath. And below the bath of photopolymerizing liquid, you've got a projector, either a DLP light projector, like a PowerPoint projector, <clears throat> or um, 
a laser that's going to scan it. And where the light shines, um, liquid uh, polymerizes uh, and, and turns solid because it's got a photo initiator in it. liquid layer we're able to project slices on the underside of this vat of photopolymerizing liquid and solidify it and then at the top um, of the picture you'll see a, a set of cones on the build platform and basically the, the way it works is that you, the, the projector solidifies a layer and then the build platform lifts up and the next layer is solidified and then the next layer is solidified until um, you've built up the 3D object so it's a little, it's almost like Terminator. The, the 3D object is pulled in slow motion out of, out of the liquid. Um, now, all of the machines still work the same way today, um, 15 years later, um, for this SLA process. It's a single material, that's the first point. So that means that these things can't be built in thin air. They, they have to grow off a platform, which means they have to be attached to the platform with supports. And once the object's 3D printed, those supports need to be removed. And where the supports touch the final object, clearly they leave pop marks and they have to remove back. That's the first point. Second point is still today, these materials in the S little SLA printers like Formlabs and others, um, they they're not fully cured in the machine so once they've been printed on the machine you take the build platform out you remove the objects from the build platform and then you put them in a light box and cure them <coughs> and as anybody will know with light curing uh, as something cures it changes uh, dimensionally typically it shrinks um so clearly anything that you've printed in 3d on one of these machines is going to change dimensionally uh, in final curing and that causes a certain printing inaccuracy. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So here's back in 2005 when we were experimenting with the technology, some examples of um, bridge frameworks that we 3D printed and you can see the plate underneath which it was attached to the build platform and that needs cutting off. So obviously they come out wet like this, they need washing in isopropanol, still the same today, not a particularly pleasant material to work with. And um, they then need post curing and they're gonna change dimensionally. The second technology that we looked at, and forgive me if I do this little journey on technology because you'll see where, where we've come to today and, and hopefully it'll add relevance to, the, um, to, to, to how things are used today. The second technology we looked at was, pot, um, uh, was uh, wax jet printing. And uh, this, this had some advantages and it had some drawbacks. So basically we've got here is two print heads, um, one, one blue, one red, as you can see there. And uh, they're basically like the print heads in an old inkjet printer, except rather than running ink through the printer, uh, it's running wax through the heads. So basically the build of wax is blue and the support wax is purple. So you can see as you build up, you build up layer by layer, jetting it out. And the first problem here you've got is these things are incredibly slow because the wax has to solidify as each drop of the wax has to solidify onto the object as it comes out. And that, that does make the build up very slow. The advantage is overcoming the SLA drawback that we saw earlier is that it's printing in two different materials. So here you've got the purple support material and encased in the support material is, is, is the bridge wax up. So the clever thing here is that the support material wax has a different melting point to the build material. So if you put it in mineral oil at six degrees C, the support material will dissolve away and leave the final build material. And these Wax ups, even though it's 15 years ago, are, are beautiful wax ups, even by today's 3D printing standards. But the process is very, very slow. So then came along a company called 3D Systems, who <clears throat> you may have heard of, and they came up with the patented idea of, of combining the two. So they put a photopolymer in, in, in one head and wax in the other, so they're printing the support in wax and they're printing the build material in photopolymer. But rather than waiting for the wax 
to um, solidify as it cools on its own droplet by droplet, which is incredibly slow. They're printing in a photopolymer. So as each droplet comes out the head of the printer onto the build platform, uh, a UV light solidifies it, which vastly improves the speed of the process. Um, and this is the technology, the polyjet technology is our preferred technology today for um, 3D printing of highly accurate models of implant models. So he, again, you pay your money and take your choice. Um, it, it may be appropriate to have a simple SLA desktop printer chair side um, in the practice for printing models to uh, vacuum form Essex retainers on, for example. <clears throat> but I wouldn't advocate using that same technology for printing detailed, complex um, implant models uh, because it may not be accurate enough and then you're going to get some problems down the line with fit. Now, just very quickly, um, and I, I like this little next set of slides, to show that the technology still needs to fit somewhere with a classic workflow. So what we did back in 2005, we were looking at it for 3D printing wax-ups for investment casting of precious and, and non-precious uh, PFM work. Um, so again, here we took the wax-up from the wax jet machine, the solid scape machine, and we invested it um and we cast it and um i have to say it cast really really well i mean that's that's 15 years ago and i'd still say um that's that's a nice casting so um it doesn't make sense to um 3d print precious metal it certainly doesn't make sense commercially to mill um precious metal um because the amount of of the cost of the raw materials a in the block and the swarf that's in the machine in any one time the scrap it's just it's not economically viable but what we can do is we can 3d print or mill the wax ups and then invest and cast them and that's that's how we do a lot of our precious uh, work these days looking at additive manufacturing or 3d printing in dental now uh here's some of the range of operations that we're doing <clears throat> Top left, you can see the blue um, crown there. So we can print wax ups for full gold crowns or non precious crowns, even. Um, we can print wax ups for partials and invest and cast them. We can print wax ups for injection molding flexible dentures. Um, we can pr print um, models for um, pressure forming uh, aligners and retainers. <clears throat> and we can directly print um, surgical guides uh, for placement of implants. So the advancement now in 3D printing um, is not only in technology, and that's moving very quickly, but also in materials. So there's a lot of research and development going on in terms of materials that can be CE marked so that we can 3D print denture bases now. Um, obviously, the materials that are used for short-term intraoral use in terms of surgical guidance are already CE marked and already out there. Um, but we're going to see more and more uh, direct printing of prosthetics and provisional restorations using 3D printing. And the 3D printing technology now <clears throat> isn't just for composites and uh, like your polymers. It's for all sorts of different materials, as we'll come on to talk about. So here's SLA, here's your little form labs. Uh, this kind of machine is going to set you back about three and a half thousand. Um, form two uh, is available now, uh, specifically for dental. And, and, and interestingly, a lot of the 3D print manufacturers and vendors see dental as their main market now. So um, dental as a vertical integrated segment has become one of the largest 3D print markets of any, any application. And I think that's a testament to both um, the clinicians and technicians out there in, in terms of their open-mindedness in adopting this technology and also the fact that the dentistry per se is a really interesting um, application of, of, of 3D printing technologies. So um, great little machines. I would, I would use those for printing models for vacuum forming on. I might use them for printing models for single crown restorations. I'm not sure that I would use SLA machines for um, implant models or more complex models. 
but they have their place and 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 certainly justifiable uh, both chair side and in the lab polyjet printing um we didn't eventually we did buy a 3d systems machine but we ended up um for the bulk of our production going with um object stratasys which is also a similar technology um of photopolymer and, and uh, wax printing and when you've printed the models uh, dissolving the supports off and being left with the final object um the the other thing to say about um polyjet versus these display mach sla machines is the, the build platform so typically in an sla machine it's quite a small build platform maybe five by ten centimeters by ten centimeters um if that on some of them it's even smaller on polyjet our machines go up to half a meter cubed so you know the polyjet machines are obviously a lot more expensive than than the sla machines um you know they're typically 25 to 60 70 thousand pounds difficult to justify in the practice um in terms of the volume of work but justifiable in a, a regional or national production center so again things will happen where they need to happen in terms of manufacturing they'll happen near to market where it makes sense for them to happen and further away from market where the capital investment cost uh, means that it needs to be in the production center we also um, use polyjet for printing anatomical models um, for our cmf work um, i say really really nice and and the great thing about polyjet is is that the materials fully cured when it comes out the machine so finished printing dissolve the supports off it completely dimensionally stable and 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 linear over the build platform this is another thing to to mention about um sla um because sla is a project projected image and particularly with the um the old machines from uh envision tech that had to get through optics, but the center of the build platform, you'd find that the accuracy was better than um, at the edge of the build platform. So the, the actual the actual build platform accuracy was non non linear, whereas with um, Polyjet, it's a hundred percent linear over the entire build platform. And for bulk production of several hundred models in one one print cycle, um, that's clearly the most um, economically viable thing to do. The positives of SLA are that a lot of these machines are open now so that you can use um, photopolymer from third party manufacturers. Um, now, form labs are quite cheeky because if you don't use a, uh, a form labs cartridge, uh, their printers automatically reduce the resolution of the print. <laughs> so non, non form labs materials print theoretically um, at less accuracy. Than, than form labs materials deliberately to dis, disencourage people from doing that. However, um, because they're open machines, a lot of these little machines, there are all sorts of um, hacks and um, tricks that you can use to get um, to, to retain that accuracy whilst using third party um, materials. Bear in mind, however, if you're saving money by using third party materials, you're also going off piste in terms of workflow. So will that material, if you're 3D printing um, surgical guides, for example, that material wouldn't be suitable for intraoral use necessarily um, or qualified CE marked because you couldn't guarantee um, that the material was fully cured um, that all of the photo initiator was used up, that there was no free um, unpolymerized uh, uh, monomer within within the build so you know i think there's going to be a lot to play out in this story about validated workflows when we come to 3d printing dentures um which we are doing now it's really really important that the material is fully cured and that there's no photo initiator left in it and um that's why it's really really important to stick to particular workflows and, and manufacturers protocols um, and, and I think you need to be aware of that when you're talking with your labs as more and more labs bring in 3d printing that, that, that they make we make sure that they're using validated workflows because the photo initiator in in these materials is carcinogenic so you know we really don't want to be putting any of that in in the uh, oral cavity 
without being 100% sure that, it, that it's fully cured. Um, and I would say the same thing um, about 3D printing and vacuum forming, because obviously if models aren't fully cured, the photo initiator can come off the model on, on, onto the blank and, and cause similar issues. So, you know, wonderful technology, absolutely think it's great chairside or in the lab, but we need to be 100% sure that what we're doing is safe for our patients. The third 3D printing technology um, that I want to talk about and uh, we're just coming up to 10 minutes to go is um, laser sintering now this prints directly in metal and these machines are very expensive still at the moment um, you're talking 250 thousand pounds upwards but they they can 3d print directly in metal um, and the way it works is that they have uh, a powder bed and a roller layers out a very thin layer of powder and then a laser guided by the computer, a bit like the lasers at the checkout at supermarket that are controlled by spinning mirrors. A laser scans across the powder and fuses the powder together. And then another layer of powders put down the laser fuses across it. So we can directly 3D print um, crown and bridge work, partials in this and in cobalt chrome, um, or indeed we're using it to print um, CMF um, cranial maxillofacial patient specific implants in in uh, titanium so here's some examples um, nearly all of our um, non-precious uh, uh, either bonded or non-bonded crown bridge work is 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 done using laser sintering now because chrome is really expensive to mill we can mill it we do mill it but um, it's very expensive in terms of the tungsten carbide tools and the time that it takes and to, on the milling machine, chrome is extremely hard material. So it really lends itself to this laser sending process, but these are very expensive machines and I don't expect uh, desktop laser sending machines to be available um, for some time yet. Although they are getting smaller and they are getting more affordable, it has to be said. So here's a nice little story on 3D printing to finish. We've got a laser sintered partial um, denture there on the left, and that's um, fully digitally manufactured. Um, that's as it's come off the machine. Um, this, obviously the support's been removed and um, it's been sandblasted. It's been heat um, cured to, to de-stress the alloy, but otherwise um, it's not had any other changes. And that is on a 3D printed polyjet model. And I can tell you when we did that, um, which is a couple of years ago now, you, know, you really know when you're on top of your game because you can just push that chrome framework and it just, you feel that wonderful click as it clicks onto the model and it's 100% passive. And you've had two totally different technologies, two totally different workflows that have joined together with a perfect fit. And um, on the right there, we can see um, a peak denture that was that was milled and there's a lot of um, talk about using peak for various different applications substructures in crown bridge work and also uh, for partials uh, and I think we'll see more of that uh, in, uh, in, in um, years to come um, also now we have 3d printing of peak and I should say whilst I'm on 3d printing that there are now um, 3d printing processes for ceramics. And this is very exciting um, because it, it means that we can do an additive buildup of a ceramic crown. If you, at the moment, we're milling ceramics out of solid blocks, monolithic blocks. And the latest blocks of ceramics that we have are layers, two layer or three layer color blocks, but we're still milling out of monolithic material. Um, if we're able to 3D print in ceramics, then it's more like the manual powder slip uh, multi-layer build-up classic process that a technician um, would, would use. And um, we're going to get much, much higher aesthetics from that. So there are 3D ceramic printers out there already that can print in, in full Vita shade guide. Um, there's more work to be done on it. They print in a, a paste. It's almost like a toothpaste that they spread and paste of ceramic uh, onto the build platform and then they photo cure it and that forms a green so-called green um, 
uh, unit, which then needs to be sintered afterwards and shrinks down to size. It's in the way that we mill pre-sintered or green state zirconia at the moment, and we mill it 30% um, bigger um, according to the um, contraction coefficient on the billet. And then when we sinter it, it, it shrinks down to size. So um, we'll be able to 3D print um, green state zirconia restorations in the not too distant future. And then we'll have to come back and look at the scanning technology because at the moment, the scanning technology is only recording the anatomical surface of the scan optically. And obviously, if, we, if we're wanting to 3D print um, a restoration, we'll need information about the internal uh, layers of uh, enamel and dentine pulp all the way through the tooth. We'll need to record digitally um, and we'll need to have a new file format, of course, rather than just SDL or triangle mashes mesh of the surface, we'll need to be able to see the, the whole um, internal structure as well. So things to come in the future. Just see if I can move this forward. To finish, um, some examples of uh, the technology that we're using for cranial maxillofacial. Uh, so we're 3D printing um, plates in titanium and we're milling at the moment um, billets of peak material uh, for cranial maxillofacial applications. Um, Peak 3D printing has just been certified, um, CMART. We're also manufacturing other orthopedic devices um, into vertebral bodies for spinal application and, and various joint replacements that can be patient specific. Um, we can see there the 3D printed um, material. Obviously, again, it's a single material, so it has to build up, so it has to have supports and those spots have to be cut back. So it's not um, without labor, there's quite a lot of process required for that. Um, and again here, just showing the classic build up, a nice little set of slides from a number of years ago showing the hybrid. So we've got a, a, a digitally manufactured, non-precious uh, CAD cast framework, which we're veneering uh, ceramic onto and getting quite a nice result. Orthodontics is a whole other area that we could come on to, but just to say, as I'm sure you're aware, digital is well embedded in orthodontics, both in fixed and removable now. And the packages are out there, um, either proprietary ones uh, with the likes of Invisalign or open packages like Maestro now um, that we use for this sort of work. Haptics will be something that comes more and more into the lab, I think. This is a virtual wax knife and it's force feedback. So as you move the virtual wax knife around, you can feel the wax flowing off the virtual knife because each axis or arm um, hinge of that device has a force feedback in it. So you can feel the model as you're working across it. And I think um, haptics and also VR and AR will become big parts of um, lab workflow and, and uh, practice workflow um, in, in the years to come. And this is showing the workflow for chromes. So again, surveying, digitally blocking out the undercuts, laying down the clasps into the undercut, mesh retention, designing the plate, 3D printing, the wax up using polyjet printing and then investing and casting. Or indeed now, as you've seen, we can skip the investment casting process and go directly um, to metal using uh, 3D, 3D printing in titanium. And again, similarly with crown and bridge here. And as you can see, some lovely uh, designs and structures. And there's a chrome printed with the latest design of supports that we can just twist off so that we have less work before we're actually finishing it and the finished chrome. And finally, some cranial maxillofacial work.
and uh, I think we're at the end of our journey. So thank you very much for listening today.